Good evening and welcome to the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. Illinois Democrats join House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's call for an impeachment inquiry of President Donald Trump in the wake of a whistleblower's report. Now there are as many people as we need it to uh, in the Congress and the House of Representatives to vote for impeachment or at least to support an inquiry. All the Democrats in Illinois' congressional delegation now support impeachment hearings as more whistleblower information comes out. FBI agents raid State Senator Martin Sandoval's offices, but Senate President John Cullerton won't strip Sandoval's chairmanship. Meanwhile, federal agents also raid Cook County Commissioner and McCook Mayor Jeff Tobolsky's offices. The city's been talking about an economic offer, but our issues really are about a lot more than money. Chicago teachers vote overwhelmingly to authorize a strike as the union continues negotiating with city officials. Mayor Lori Lightfoot crashes Chicago's new ICE director's press conference where he was deriding the city's sanctuary ordinance. And in sports... Able to avoid the pressure and then launches it to the end zone! All eyes now turn to the Bears as the Cubs tank in the final weeks of the baseball season. Joining us are Mike Flannery of Fox 32 News, Sarah Karp of 91.5 WBEZ News, Heather Sharon of The Daily Line, and Xavier Pope, a contributor to Forbes.com. Let's get right into it. Mike Flannery, the Trump presidency has survived scandal after scandal. Does it survive this one? I, I still don't see where 67 votes in the U.S. Senate to convict him and kick him out of office are. Uh, so, uh, yes. Uh, I do think that locally the consequence of all this is going to be an absolute law, giant traffic jam at every ballot box next year in the state of Illinois. Uh, downstate, rural Illinois turning out perhaps in bigger numbers than ever uh, to vote for the president should he still be on the ballot. And uh, up in this area, uh, uh, anti-Trumpsters turning out in record-breaking numbers. Sarah Karp, the fact that a moderate Democrat like Dan Lipinski is on the impeachment inquiry train, at least, is, is that a, a signal that Democrats think that most of the country is behind them and at least wanting to investigate this Ukraine deal further? It sounds like most of the country, especially the Democrats, are behind this inquiry I mean from all that I've heard and seen and you know I guess he his statement was not like really strong it was sort of like well I think we should look into it not you know not one of those people who like impeach him today you know he should get thrown out tomorrow but it does sound like him moving to that direction and and really you know even Republicans, I haven't really seen that many Republicans except for some of the real diehards come out and be like oh this is a this was a great idea for this conversation to take place. It sounds like they're they're also sh sort of trying to play it safe just in case this becomes something that, that does get him out of Some of, of them are hedging both sides. One of those Republicans, Adam Kinzinger from the near by the Chicago area. What's his calculus on all of this? Well, he is the last remaining Republican member of sort of the Northern Illinois delegation. So he's in sort of a strange position. And his statement was basically like, well, this doesn't really seem kosher, but like maybe let's just look at it a little bit more, but not get too worked up about it. What was interesting is that the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee this, uh, this evening put out polling that showed a significant move toward in favor of impeachment, not not only among Democrats, but also independents and Republicans. And I think if that polling continues to show that and continues to grow, I think people will begin to make different political calculuses, especially as people start to look at those results from the 2018 midterms and say, gosh, this isn't going to make my job getting reelected any easier. Xavier Pope, Mike Flannery says, yeah, there aren't 67 votes. The supermajority in the Senate needed to remove President Trump should impeachment get there. But... As Heather mentions, with this polling going one way, do you think there could be more things that come out that move enough senators into that, into that category? Potentially, you have 22 seats that are up um, on the Republican side as, where, as opposed to 12 on the Democratic side. So that calculus may change depending on where the country is. We're still early in this whistleblower complaint in terms of looking in and determining who said what as, part, as it gets parsed out a little bit more. So I think that calculus definitely would change. For instance, Democrats today subpoenaed uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Uh, they, they are, are looking at other possible phone calls with foreign heads of state that were shoved into the shelf saying, uh, 
don't ever look at, don't ever... Nothing to <laughs> this see here. Never right, right. see the light of day. Well, and, and uh, Vladimir Putin's spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, in the Kremlin uh, today actually d came over and told reporters uh, at some venue, uh, well, gee, uh, uh, President Putin hopes that none of his conversations are released. Um, I'm sure a lot of head of states would feel that way. Yeah. Well, it's, it's important to look at the impeachment inquiry as an evidence-gathering process in terms of... So we don't know actually what's going to happen in terms of when there's more information, there's more individuals maybe sinking themselves in front of Congress. So that may change ex how we even look at this whole process. Could be an evidence-gathering process all the way up to the 2020 election. It's important to remember that once you start a process like impeachment, which I think we probably all remember from the Clinton impeachment, is that you, there's no telling where it's going to go, what it's going to find, what's going to change. And I think we saw that just this week. Uh, we if we had been taping the show last Friday, we wouldn't have had any of this to talk about. Right. So that's how it can move very, very speaking, fast. Speaking of no telling where anything is going to go, uh, Mike Flannery, why are the feds interested in the, the triumvirate of Southwest suburbs, Summit, Lyons, and McCook? Well, uh, um, I've actually got uh, U.S. Attorney John Lausch uh, appearing on uh, on my show on nice another station. Right, right. Uh, 10 o'clock tonight. 10 o'clock tonight, yeah. yeah. Viewers um, can watch Channel 11 all the way up until 10. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, he, he doesn't give it away. Uh, however, we know this, that uh, Marty, State Senator Martin Sandoval, uh, who had a reputation in Springfield and uh, here in Chicago for being a loudmouth and sometimes acting like a nitwit, um, the feds raided his uh, uh, home on the southwest side. They raided his state capitol office in Springfield, and they raided his office in Cicero. He represents all three of those suburban towns you listed. Um, also active in that neck of the woods, Eddie Burke, under indictment on corruption charges, and Speaker Mike Madigan, who does appear when you read the whole totality, the 120-page FBI agent's affidavit filed at the time of Burke's arrest, uh, the original charges against Burke, and then you look at what's going on, it looks like they are... The feds are might in, be interested, although he's not, interested he's in not Speaker named Madigan. publicly in any investigation. Correct. Sarah Carp has not been accused of any wrongdoing. So do all roads lead to Madigan here, do you think? You know, I, I don't really know, but I think that he's definitely in that loop. I mean, one thing I think about with all these south suburbs and southwest suburbs is those places fly under the radar. And so if you're going to do something or, t you know, if there's something going on, I mean, from what I read about Sandoval, this is, they're looking to a kickback scheme. Those are places where... Things can happen and no one's going to look. Well, there's a giant quarry there that they can just bury everything That's in. right, that's right. Well, in McCook, a town of 230 people, how many right. of those work for for government? <laughs> a lot of them. And, I, and, a, and a lot of the mayor's family is on the payroll. Who right. also happens to be a Cook County Board Commissioner who quite... This is Jeff Tobolsky. Jeff Tobolsky, who coincidentally was absent from the Cook County Board meeting this week. I'm sure that was just a coincidence. He said he was out sick on he his had birthday. Fed flu. Yeah, he had, <laughs> had one of beef delivered as a please celebrate my birthday in absentia, which might be the most Chicago thing that has happened in, in recent weeks. But my question is, is what does this have to do with Danny Solis and the wire mm. that he was wearing for two years? Now, Danny Solis was used to be Martin Sandoval's campaign treasurer, so they're tight. You know, is this all part of the huge investigation that essentially got unleashed when Danny Solis was, you know, confronted by the, by the federal officials and decided to wear a wire for well, two I know. years. We've, we've talked about this and, and, uh, and, and many other uh, longtime journalists here. Uh, I mean, it appears that this is the biggest operation that we're in the early days of here, something that could be eventually as big as Greylord that put dozens of judges and lawyers and crooked court bailiffs and clerks in prison. Um, this this could be as big or bigger. You know, the oh. interesting thing here, though, is that it doesn't seem like there's like a thread, like yeah. like that they've all well, committed there's multiple threats, right? Or that, but it's like have they all committed the. If they've committed a crime, is it the same crime? How is how, how are those all connected? Right. It's kind of hard to. Carrie Austin as well, right. but you have the same prosecutor in in the U.S. Attorney's Office that's sort of manning all of these cases, including John Coley, the union guy. Xavier Pope, do you do you see a big sort of master plan here? Or are the feds just shaking the tree and? Looking at what fruit falls out of the sky. You shake a lot in Chicago, you see what happens, you fall out. But uh, I think that we're just seeing all the different webs and the relationships are more so the, the interconnecting of it all. But they may all have their own individual schemes among themselves. You know what, I think here's the effect. Uh, if, if, if you or I or you were, were to walk up 
to an alderman these days and uh, we and, should assume we're being recorded and yes. suggest and suggest hey I'll pay you hey I need that curb cut permit I need it yesterday they'll can run you, for the can hills. you backdate it they're not gonna touch it they're nervous and that's good I'm sure there's uh, a, a lot of us that are on some of these recordings with Alderman Solis, former Alderman Solis, because we all talked to him. Heather, wh what's the next shoe to drop here? Well, what's interesting is that there's a former federal prosecutor on the fifth floor of Chicago City Hall, Lori Lightfoot. She worked in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and every time she's come before cameras in recent days, she's been asked about these, and she gets just a little smile on her face. And, you know, she said things like, well, it's interesting, mm -hmm. and there's a lot to come. And I think that that indicates she probably doesn't know any more than any of us do. Mm -hmm. But she knows well enough to know that when you launch this number of raids in this short period of time, you're either A, sending your message, or B, you're getting ready to haul some well, people in. Speaking of sending a message, what about the, the way they're doing these raids in broad day? Daylight, uh, like a made-for-TV movie bags special labeled with yeah. evidence. Bags that right. say evidence. Yeah. What does that say? Yeah, so it's it's part of the strike fear in the heart of the crooks uh, strategy that I think they're consciously pursuing. Um, you know, and and uh, this U.S. attorney is is a native of the Chicago area. I mean, he grew, south side guy. Yeah, yeah, south south suburban guy. Uh, you know, he was the captain of the Joliet Catholic High School team that won the 1988 state championship. I mean, he knows this stuff in his bones. Uh, and I, I think, and, and, and there are others in that office too, I think they know what they're doing. And the raids were all going on at the same time this week. They were, it was just all this whole coordinated effort. And, well, so and these are all simultaneous cases. And yeah. uh, uh, Mike and I were discussing before, before the show, they need some kind of software that sort of keeps everything uh, straight. So. All right, it's time for us to move on to our education notebook. The Chicago Teachers Union sends a strong message to the mayor with a 94% strike authorization vote. Both Chicago newspapers editorialize that the deal offered by Mayor Lightfoot is a good one. Bernie Sanders and John Cusack are in town to support the CTU as Alderwoman Susan Sadlowski Garza is unapologetic for an expletive-laden speech. Meanwhile, could school support staff, SEIU members go on strike as well. Sarah Karp, were you surprised that this strike authorization vote had such overwhelming support among union members? A little. I mean, I, I thought it would pass. I think we all sort of thought it would pass, but I was thinking in the mid-80s, and 94% is pretty resounding. Now, last night when they announced the, the results, they said that they had only counted 90% of the votes, so there's still some room. It might be a little less once the, the final results come in, but um, it's well above the 75% that they needed. And, and you know, it's, it's sort of an interesting thing. On, on Wednesday, I think it was, there was a uh, front-page newspaper Sometimes newspapers said, you know, take the deal, teachers, and it's like all the teachers said, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> well, so the fact that both Sun Times editorial board, which is more to the left, and Tribune, which is more to the right, they're both saying take the deal. Does that mean and the, the fact finder said that the city's offer was an excellent offer? So will the public support a walkout this time, like they did in Mayor Emanuel's first negotiation with the teachers? You know, I really think it comes down to how well the the teachers union can make the case that this is not about salary, that it's about trying to improve working conditions. And I actually think that parents on the ground, they know that there's problems with how schools are running. I mean, they know that there's no nurses. They know that, that it's hard to find a social worker. They know that there's, there's teacher vacancies. So maybe we're paying teachers, as Lori Lightfoot says, the best in the nation, which is not true. But, you know, they know that there's schools that can't find teachers in Chicago, and part of that is because of pay, but the other part of it is because there is a reputation that Chicago Public Schools is not a wonderful place to work. And so if they can make that case to parents, which they've been trying to do, and I don't know how much it's resounding, but if they can, I do think that parents will stand beside them because they know what their children are experiencing. So it's a hard case to make, though, if you're, the, the reports that they're coordinating a strike with with park district workers and, and security guards, where there may not be another option for kids to go if there is a strike. And so right. if parents are looking and saying, hey, I, if I, I could take my kids to a park, and now I can't Which because... It happened in the last strike. Yeah. That was available. They went to park district yeah, so exactly. facilities. So then parents won't be necessarily as sympathetic toward the, toward the demand. It's not clear, though, how much they were really coordinating with the park district or how much that just sort of came up at the same, same time. time. So, or I the mean, union's trying to, like, test out the new mayor, saying, let's see what we can get from this 
relative novice. But, I, and, and, and here's a piece that I don't think is mentioned enough. I mean, how much is this going to cost taxpayers? Yeah. I, I don't see that covered. And I know, so the Illinois Policy Institute has a guy did a study, and I know there are those who curl their lips when you mention <laughs> yeah. that group. But, but as far as I can tell, the math is, is, is accurate. For the owner of a $350,000 condo home, 221 bucks a year if the teachers union dem in additional property tax increases if the teachers union demands uh, are, are um, all is met. Is that including uh, social worker like the social worker the, demands the and hundreds the of additional staff yes. So Heather staffers. should parents be circling a date on their calendar uh, that uh, they might have to find some alternate arrangements for their kids? Sure Sarah and I have kids you're always planning for the inevitable and the catastrophes to come so on Wednesday the leaders the delegates of the union will meet to set a strike date the earliest that could be would be October 7th so if you want to circle a date you could circle that one the question is will Lori Lightfoot want to start her first term with a walkout or will she figure out a way to make a deal and a potential source of money she could do exactly what Rahm Emanuel did in 2016 was to dip into the city's tax increment financing district which had a huge surplus this year and she could use some of that money to sweeten the pot. She's going to need that money to, to balance an $838 million yes. deficit budget. Sarah Karp, um, what are the sticking points other than more uh, resources in the schools? What about the, the fact that the union wants a three-year contract, she wants a five-year contract? You know, I really think that the union has said many times salary is not the issue here and I think they would go for a five-year contract and you know this is an interesting thing you, you um you talk about the money well Lori Lightfoot has said that she's going to hire all these people that the union wants hired anyways so if that's the case then it's not really a money issue what it's what this is more about is that Lori Lightfoot and CPS does not want to make the contract govern the school district. They want to govern the school district. And they feel like if they put all these promises into the contract, that then that means that you know they're beholden to this contract, not to what they want to do. And it leaves them little flexibility. So, so their hands would be tied. Right. So that's really what this is about. They have an ideological point of view that that's not what this con what contract should be about. All right. We need to move on to some other city news. Mayor Lightfoot slams the new Chicago ICE chief over raids and sanctuary city status. The mayor answers tough questions from kids at her latest budget town hall meeting. Meanwhile, the mayor gets input from aldermen on how to tackle the $838 million budget deficit. Heather Sharon, um, why is Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, very active in Chicago and, and across the country this week? Well, of course, President Trump has promised to deport undocumented immigrants, and we had two raids in Chicago this week, one raid on the southeast side. Five people were arrested at a pizza restaurant, and two people were, were arrested after a traffic stop in back the yards, both of which caused huge amount of controversies, and which was why Lori Lightfoot showed up outside a press conference called by the new Chicago field office director of ICE to say, basically, uh, not in my city, and I'm not going to cooperate you with you in any possible they, way. That, they also didn't cooperate in <laughs> extending that invite for this press conference to all media. We, you and I were we not let in. The, the we're not led into that press conference. Uh, Mike Flannery, do you get any sense of how Mayor Lightfoot uh, is going to go about closing this $838 million budget gap? And will there be, as Alderman Anthony Beal has suggested, an aldermanic revolt over this? Um, I think some of her key people are going to have trouble voting for this. Because remember, this we've got a property tax increase baked in here. This is before the teachers union is done with the, the 221 bucks a year there. I mean, you know, it, there's a taxpayer revolt looming over the horizon that uh, that I think it could it could make some big changes. Now, only in certain parts of town, um, but that's uh, they, they happen to be the growing parts of town and and the the city council remap may give them additional power in 2021 and 2022 uh, uh, but um, you know I, I don't think the, the vibes I get is that they haven't figured out how to close that hole you know there there are there are things she would like to do that require Springfield but do you get the vibes as Alderman Anthony Beale is suggesting that a lot of his colleagues really want to turn on the mayor. They just uh, haven't found the right opportunity. I yet. don't think. I don't think. Uh, I think some do. Some um, are are angry at the way they've been treated behind the scenes, um, but not enough 
to to uh, to come up with the 25 or 26 Remember, she, votes. And she put out a poll this week uh, suggesting that she's still relatively popular. It was from several um, months ago, but, but, but I think she ago. still is. And right. until she starts pushing for these big tax increases, until the strike hits. That's um, when the real honeymoon is over. That's, that's when the rubber meets the road. That's when the political capital has to be spent. Heather Sharon, any specifics that you're seeing uh, as possible new revenue ideas, well, what's, cuts? What's interesting is that there are 18 members of the Progressive Caucus. It's the largest it's ever been on the city council, and it's really a result of this past election where the city council is now more progressive, more left, younger, and less white. Now, those 18 aldermen all support reinstituting the corporate head tax, which would levy a fee on Chicago companies per employee. Now, one of the first things Rahm Emanuel did when he took office was to ax this tax. Now, some of the aldermen want it to be as much as $16 per employee per much, which would generate hundreds of millions of dollars for the city. I don't think that Mayor Lightfoot is going to go for that, though. She's basically ruled out this head tax. The problem is, is that the, really the only way the city can raise revenue by itself is to raise property taxes. Almost every other increase has to go through Springfield, and no one in Springfield has the appetite for more tax increases. You may remember on the head tax, Rahm said that had been specifically requested by Ford Motor Company, which employs five or 6,000 people at 126th and Torrance. Yep. That was, they asked him to eliminate the head tax before they invested $5 billion in, in upgrading and modernizing that plant and hiring hundreds of new workers. So now to turn around and reinstate it and to triple it or quadruple it would be insane. There's a definite trade-off. All right, let's move on to sports finally. The Cubs complete collapse, or they have completed their collapse, <laughs> and it likely spells the end of the Joe Madden era. The Bears look to an up-tempo game to help quarterback Mitch Trubisky, and the Bulls launch the new season with a celebration of the city hosting the NBA All-Star Game. Xavier Pope, what the heck happened to the Cubs in the last two weeks? Nine straight losses. Uh, and the, we're, we're scratching our heads right now. This is something that, that Chicago fans were used to maybe 20 years ago, or maybe the Cubs started winning, and uh, Theo Epstein said this is the year of reckoning, and that year of reckoning has followed the Cubs all the way to the end, and this may cause Joe Madden. Joe Madden. Uh, then that's my question. Is Joe Madden a definite shoe-in to lose his job? The way Epstein talked about Joe Madden's job, it just... We should celebrate him and his time that he's been here. It was it, it's something he was. Dude is dead. Dude walking. I want to know what happens to his new restaurant over there, uh, right by the the park. Uh, it's a pretty good place. If he's if he's out of town. My question is, what happens to the Cubs' new marquee sports network? Are yeah. people going to pony up twenty dollars a month to see Cubs right, win the end of nine games or lose nine games in a row? It's, end it's of bad timing from the Cubs from a business perspective. WGN's rich history broadcasting the Cubs. Um, so, who would uh, David Ross has been a name uh, bandied yeah. about as a future manager? What do you think? I, I don't know. At this point, I have no idea what's going to happen because we still don't know whether Joe, Joe Madden's going to keep this job. It's but it's a strange dynamic, right? You yeah. win the World Series, you come back a couple years later, most. Of the guys you were friends with, you were buddies with in the locker room, and all of a sudden you're the boss? I, I don't know. To Jojo Hill man's credit, I mean, he's he's made the playoffs every year but this year that he's been with the Cubs. Well, this, it's a pretty good record. Yes, but this is not the, your dad's Chicago Cubs. This, this is not. I mean, there's, there's so much money invested in the team, but the this, neighborhood, a new network. This team has to win every Shouldn't season. Theo Epstein get lion's share of the blame for what happened this year, given the roster has just not really performed? The roster hasn't performed. Also, there's some injuries. Um, they had some, some bullpen issues at the end. Um, their closer tanked out. It was it was just a year that, that Chicago fans would uh, assume. Given the disappointment at, with the White Sox, do you think they'll hire Joe Madden if he gets fired? <laughs> <laughs> that might be a good Definitely. hire. Poor, uh, poor Rick Renneria. He's, he's always the uh, the appetizer <laughs> to Joe Madden. Twice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what about Mitch Trubisky? Can he replicate his decent performance uh, against he's a good decent. defense? <laughs> <laughs> the Redskins are, are, are awful, number right. one. Um, they instilled this uh, up-tempo offense, no huddle offense. He threw seven of eight um, uh, when he was in the no huddle offense, and it seems to be working for him. Taylor Gabriel, who's now going to be out for the next game, um, caught three touchdowns in that offense, and he looks good, but we'll see what He might have a, a, a dart of uh, pass catchers if Taylor Gabriel is not there. Yeah, they, they have uh, Ryler Ridley, who hasn't played yet, who's going to be um, taking on Gabriel's spot in the game. All right, Mike Flanner is a resident Sox fan on this panel. Next year is going to be a big year, Make right? Make your World Series reservations. <laughs> uh, I'll and, place my bets in Vegas. <laughs> Trust the process. Well, you can go over to Merrillville. Well, that's right. I yeah. can't do anything in Chicago yet. Yeah. But. No, disappointing. God, that second half of the first half was, was – uh, 
was just catnip. It was wonderful. It was fantastic. And going, yeah, but then coming out of the All Star break, yeah, they, collapsed. they collapsed. What happened? I, I, Tim and Anderson get hurt. Gets had some injuries there. And after the All Star break, you know, the start separating the winners from the losers, and the Sox just flat out aren't there yet. But the plan has been good. They've, they've had a lot of great farm system, a lot of great talent. I think that Sox fans are comfortable with the, the growth of the team. Michael Kopech coming back next it, year from Tommy John surgery. Exactly. So I think the Sox are in good shape. They, they are going along with their plan in terms of being a successful baseball club. And I wonder if that plan includes Rick Renneria as their manager next year. I, I, I think it possibly will. I think that we're, I, there, there's no one calling for anyone's head on this team. I think that this team is just in a process of growth, and I think fans are comfortable with that. Well, we've see. been comfortable with all your views on this panel, but we're out of time. Mike Flannery, Sarah Carp, Heather Sharon, Xavier Pope, thank you all for being here. I'm Paris Schutz, and we'll see you on the next edition of the Week in Review. Xavier Pope, I didn't even realize that, I mean, Blackhawks and Bulls season are gearing up, too. What do we need to know about? Well, we need to know the Bulls uh, are marketing other players in their marketing as, like, as if they're part of the team. That's really, really weird. You mean like of. players on other teams? Yeah, like they're, you're, you're seeing like buy season tickets. It's two Chicago Bulls. To and then like Giannis or something. Right, exactly. When the Bucks Giannis play. or LeBron James. Or That's when you know you're, you don't have high expectations. <laughs> Absolutely. Is yeah. there any plan in that organization? Like the White Sox have had a you know a definitive plan. I don't know what the Chicago Bulls plan is other than celebrating them hosting the All-Star Game. The Michael Jordan statue is a great, uh, great banner. Great thing. <laughs> Those banners are great. They're beautiful. Let's talk about 1990s again. <laughs> That's the plan. Well, it's better than the bear. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Robert Clifford is the honoree of this year's Illinois Bar Foundation's annual fundraising event that raises money to enhance the availability of justice for those without attorneys throughout the state.